evening and welcome to season five, episode four of Inside the Rookery. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, you're full of crackles again. I'm just going to interrupt you there. Oh, uh, your voice has gone all poor over the course of that one. It's exactly the same issue we had when Jay was on, if you remember. Anyway, carry on and let's see how it goes. Apologies <laughs> okay. for the sound is what I'm going to sum that one up with as we do our introduction. So I'm Great Andy start. Law, host of Inside the Rookery. I'm joined by Andy Law and Andy Leask, both veterans of the TTRPG industry. And of course, our special guest this week, Gareth L. Powell, who is here to talk about writing, a field guide for aspiring authors, and really anything else he wants to talk about. We are here for it. So Gareth is the most shortlisted author of the British Science Fiction Association Awards. He's known for his fast-paced, character-driven science fiction, exploring <laughs> themes of identity loss and the human condition. So welcome to the stream, Gareth. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I, I, I hope I'm clear. And, yeah. Um, so we've got some pre-submitted questions from our patrons and our friendly Discord community. Please do check it out. I'm sure one of the Andes will put the link in the chat at some point. But we will also, as always, be taking questions and comments from the chat. So please do just jump in if there's anything you'd like to ask. But before we get to that, I'm going to hand over to Gareth for as long or as short as an introduction as he would like to give us. Oh, blimey. Um, OK. Um, <laughs> My name's uh, uh, Gareth. I'm a science fiction author. I've written um, 18 books. Um, and the one we were talking about today is this one about writing from uh, Galance, which is available in hardback from um, uh, the in the US and the UK. That's uh, basically everything I know about writing. Um, to encourage aspiring authors and it's not a sort of finger waggy book saying thou must do this and thou must do that it's more of a an encouraging friendly kind of pat on the shoulder and come on you can do this so that's me <laughs> we do have a, a question that's come in um pre-submitted from Seagull as always Seagull is very early to both come in the chat and submit the questions and and maybe We'll get to see Goat's question, but maybe you can talk a little bit about um, what's in the about writing book and how it relates to Sea Goat's question. Because Sea Goat's asked, "How do you get started in writing? Just write stuff until someone likes what you write, or is there more to it?" Maybe talk a bit about your background and how you got started. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to go to a crossroads at midnight and make a pact with a <laughs> demon. Um, no, I mean, the, the way I got started was writing short stories and um when i felt that they were starting to get good i started submitting them firstly to sort of free online websites um where you know people would discuss them in the in the comments and stuff and then later to sort of print magazines when i felt i was ready i submitted one to interzone which is the longest running uk short story magazine and um that got published and the stories being in interzone i had a few in there um, brought me to the attention of publishers and agents. Um, so when I was ready to write a novel, I wasn't completely un... <coughs> got my own crackle problems. <laughs> the, um... <laughs> you fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, when I was ready to approach uh, agents and publishers, I wasn't an unknown quantity. They already knew who I was. They'd seen my stories coming up through the genre magazines, and they do keep an eye on that stuff, I think. So what, what stage in your career then did you go about picking up an agent? I presume you'd been published first in short stories, etc. And then did you did you make a submission to an open category or did someone approach you? Yeah, I kind of did it all backwards. Um, <laughs> I, I did it almost the exact opposite of the way everyone tells you to do it, which is I, um, after, after the stories appeared in Interzone, I was approached by two uh, small presses. One wanted to do a collection of short stories, and the other wanted to know if I had any novels or anything on the go. And I just so happened I had written a novel called Silver Sands, which was about 70,000 words long. Um, and they published it in a little hardback 300 copies limited edition. Oh. But it picked up a couple of nice reviews in a couple of nice places. Um, so the following year, I... Uh, got introduced to the um, uh, 
the, 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 the main editor at Solaris Books and pitched him a novel. And he said, OK, can you write it in six months? And I ran away and I wrote it in four. And I wrote three novels for him before I thought, it's probably time I got an agent. And you know, went from there. So it was uh, very much cart before the horse in, in that um, in that way. Usually you wouldn't get through a, a publisher's door without an agent. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate. Yeah, really, really interesting. And and how did how did the book about writing come about? Then where did you presumably you'd published quite a lot of books before you decided to jump into helping other people? Was it a development of like guest lectures you'd done, or or did you just jump straight into the book? Well, I I, I say I wrote this book by accident. It was, uh, I I would, I don't think I'd ever have the, um, you know, I don't think my imposter syndrome would ever let me sit down and write a book about how to write a book. It, it seems too, um, too much hubris. But what I'd done is, as I was going through this process of the, with the short stories and moving into the novels and so forth, I had a, a blog on blogger.com, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. Still and, have one. <laughs> uh, is it still going? <laughs> Yeah, it's still Lovely. going. It's still um, out there somewhere. Yeah. Well, and I was sort of recording things as I learned them. So I was like, oh, so that's how you write a synopsis. So I, I wrote a huh. book, how to write a synopsis. So I was basically like scouting out the territory and then leaving notes for people coming behind me saying that this is what you're doing. And eventually, you know, that built up to quite a lot of blog posts. And then one day I backed them all up into a Word document and it came out to like 60,000 words. And I thought... Wow, I've just written That's a book. A book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I had it somewhat similar when I was um, doing writing style sheets and style guides for various submissions that were coming to me when I was running one role play game or another. And I found myself at the end of it just looking at it going, I've written about 40,000 words to try and tell everyone else how they should be doing this. And I was like, I should maybe do something with that. You took the step I did not take. <laughs> I'm, I'm very yeah. impressed. Well, uh, I mean... I tweeted, um, you know, just after I backed it up and looked at it, I tweeted, blimey, I've accidentally written a book. <laughs> and I got an instant um, DM from Luna Press saying, we'll publish it. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> That's got to feel pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So they published a um, a couple of years ago a um, nice little paper, sort of pocket-sized paper back version Um which was which was popular, but it was um, Gillian Redfern and Galantz who liked it so much and was giving it out to authors she was signing that she um, bought out the contract oh, wow. um, from Luna oh. Press, and then so that um, and we re-edited it, and I added another twenty thousand words on different topics and so forth, and we were able to bring out the new big expanded hardback edition through Galant. So, and yeah, it was a, a little book that could, that just came out of nowhere, really. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. One of the things that's really nice, if I can just give, give a little, like, advert for, for the book I was talking about, like, one of the Go things on! I think people will find particularly useful about it is, like, the way you've structured it. Obviously, there are, you know, parts and sections, but each, like, it, it, it is, like, I, I can see now you've said it's, it originated as a blog. I can see that in, in its DNA, because... It is little bite sized but super focused. So you could just read it cover to cover, um, and that'd be very entertaining. But if you want to just look at a particular thing, it's really easy to just dip in and, and kind of get very focused um, and, and sort of supportive advice. So um, yeah, it really it really is is packed full of, of really useful stuff. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, f I find um, you know obviously I've read a lot of sort of writing advice books, and the ones that are just endless, endless pages of text, and you you know you have to read through. The whole life story and and you know I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone particularly here but you have to read through everything and it's it, you, by the time you find the bit of information you're looking for you've fallen asleep so i wanted to make this like super searchable and you could that's why i called it a field guide because it's like you can just like if you run into a problem you can just pick it up and look at the page that details with that problem we've had a, just a, a big shout out to world anvil just had a few readers <laughs> pop in from the world anvil stream so hi light up the forge as always 
Right. So I'm just thinking about my uh, a favourite um, book of mine that came from a blog, Jenny Lawson, the bloggist, quite famously, her first book was Let's Pretend This Never Happened came from her blog. And I had been following that blog for years before her book came out. So um, I'd also like to support the old a lot of other writing guides can be somewhat Let's yeah, not use no. the word turgid, but let's Sorry. just say I did. Um, and some of them really can be somewhat turgid. You start and you're like, I've re read so much and I've so far not encountered anything that's applicable to why I picked up this book in the first place. And mm -hmm. I'll admit that the um, somewhat super hyper-focused, laser-pointed uh, choices that you've made appeal to me deeply. I shall be <laughs> purchasing a copy immediately. <laughs> and so should everyone else. <laughs> everyone. Everyone. <laughs> but yeah, no, that, that appeals to me greatly. <clears throat> so, a bit more of a practical question from Kilishandra. Someone spelt that wrong. I will fix that, Kilishandra. We apologize. Um, what's your preferred writing environment? Oh, Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. I think we can all do that one. Yeah, no, I I, I write here usually. Uh, I'm at my desk at the moment. Um, so I write here. It's very quiet. It's peaceful. There's a nice view of a tree just out the window next to me here. Um, or I quite like working in quiet cafes because there's something about the, the buzz that keeps my mind focused and stops my thoughts drifting away. So. I find the cafe one particularly interesting. We've had we've spoken to a lot of authors over the course of the last four or five seasons, and a significant number of them will drop the cafe line. And off they all have different reasons. Um, our very first episode of ours was Steve Savile. As I recall, he liked listening in to everybody else in a lot of their mm. conversations. Not that he was an idea thief from everybody's lives, <laughs> um, but, it, but it, it gave him a, a yeah. strong sense of character that he might it's, not yeah. otherwise have originally thought of himself in his head. And then he developed it further. Yeah. And he really enjoyed having that as an environment for himself because it just sparked his imagination. Where others saying, just needed noise, yeah. that white I'm, noise going on. I'm sure he won't mind me saying, like, he's not definitely not an ideas thief, but he's maybe a voice thief. Like, that, that's what I find useful about, about there is, is hearing the cadence of, of how people talk, because otherwise all your characters end up sounding exactly like you, and you don't want that. Um, so it lets They're you all middle class different. white guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so, uh, Jay Diane dots it. Hi, Diane. Hey! Admittedly, I'm highly hey! biased, but this is the best book on writing I've ever come across. Stay around, Diane. You might get a shout out later in the stream from a particular question. And I wouldn't <laughs> call that biased. I would just say it's sound reason. <laughs> Stephen Erickson has enjoyed writing in cafes for similar reasons. And creative go. teacher taught. I says, I enjoy working <laughs> in cafes sometimes too, especially when you need a change of environment. I kind of love that name. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, if Stephen Erickson is, is writing his stuff in cafes, like how much caffeine must he be drinking? Because you're like, how, how big are the mouths that are the phone? Like, you need to check his blood pressure. Wow. The, the other thing about uh, working in cafes as well, I mean, they've done studies about kind of low levels of sort of white noise are really good for concentration. The other thing is you can't just get up and wander about. So you, you have huh. to stay that down yeah. because... You can't just stand up and, and like because when I'm sitting here, I get easily distracted by stuff, and I go and look out the window, or I go and get a cup of tea, or yeah, me know. too. And when I get to the kitchen, I realise I need to stack the dishwasher, and then I, I oh, the floor could do with the mop. Mm. Um, so when I'm in a cafe, you can't really do that. People look at you weird if you get up and wander about. So you just have you just have to stay sat in your seat. I, I think I think Gareth that you may just have increased Andy Law's and therefore my cafe budget by that <laughs> No, I, I, I really I hadn't even considered that. I'm like, yeah, 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 that. No, because um, uh, we'd had previously as well, I can't remember who said this one, but they said that uh, for them, sometimes they needed to get out of the house and the house environment, and, and they would spend weeks at a time using the cafe as their workplace. So they would go to work and then come back and allow themselves to have a certain amount of physical as well as perhaps mental distance from their work. And mm. and that I could understand, but that one I really get. Mm. Yeah. It, it might have been Ben Aronovich, maybe. That might have been Ben. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. I, kind the, of like uh, writing, I couldn't write on a train. I like I like writing on trains. Yeah. Um and reading on trains my favorite place to read is on the train actually. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, I see uh, in the chat, Diane said um, she used to go to university libraries yeah. for this reason too. And there's the, um, in Bristol, we have a, a reference library, which is lots of little desks and, and surrounded by shelves. And you have to be silent. <laughs> and if you, the old wooden f chairs and the flagstone floors, I mean, if you move it, <laughs> you, you have to sit completely still and just sit there and type and you can't move or you know mess around or and there's always that feeling that those people on that table think i'm a poser so i have to make sure i'm actually working yeah. and <laughs> I have to, I have to keep my fingers moving yeah. i love a university library i did all my work in the university library i mean andy would send me there i didn't go willingly but you know <laughs> <laughs> once mm. i got there it was great <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, the staff would trade with you. Oops, sorry. Sorry, thank um. you. <laughs> Slick. <laughs> right, so what does Martin asks? As a starting suggestion before writing, do you do detailed plan, loose by chapter plan, or post its and string everywhere? Um I do I guess if you did, if you thought of like uh, maps, so you had a very, um, like if there's a very detailed printed like hiking map with um, contour lines and, and all of that, I don't do that. What I do, is, <laughs> what I do is more like a back of a napkin map. So I'll do, you know, start here, end here, uh, or maybe you'll pass the post office here. Um, you know, oh, there be dragons and, and so on. And so I kind of know where I'm going and I kind of know a couple of beats I'm going to hit along the way, but the rest of it is um, unexplored terrain and I get to be creative in between those landmarks, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. I think Terry Pratchett, I think it was, said it's like going down into a valley full of trees on a foggy day and you can see across the valley, but going through the valley is, you know, you're you're having to find your own way through. And it's the only way you can see the detail is to actually be down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I like that. Question from the chat. Um, <laughs> if you are having an off day, do you push through and write, or do you wait until you feel better? Um, a mix. Sometimes I can um, be self-disciplined, and sometimes it's just a case of sitting down and getting on with it. And other times it's just when you think it's just really not happening. It's probably better just to step away and go for a walk or you know get on and you know if this is going to be a wasted day I might as well go and do something constructive like mow the lawn or, or whatever um, and then when I come back to it maybe I'll be feeling more refreshed and the well will have refilled a bit um, so it's it's kind of a gut call about whether this is a, mm -hmm. a knuckle down or bugger off kind of situation. For me, uh, it tends to, oh, oh, go Andy. Well, I was going to say, sometimes I think like going and doing something else, like you say, mowing the lawn, washing the dishes, whatever, like that almost seems to let my subconscious process whatever it is that's, that's blocking it. And if I'm like, oh, how do I, oh, and I can't, and I just can't see a way out of a corner I've written myself into, going away, doing something else. And then I'm like, oh, it's this. And it's like my brain has figured it out, but I was getting in my own way. So I, I get a huge number of plot ideas from when I'm stepping out of the shower or you know or on a long drive so I've, I've you know i've got my phone so now i can just say hey siri take a note and then just dictate this plot point i've thought of without taking my hands off the steering wheel yeah. um, for me for me it's walking um because there's fuck all else to do when i'm walking other than just think over everything note. else <laughs> good to hear <laughs> yeah it's definitely for me walking though because because uh, uh, i often get myself into a state where i'm not going anywhere else and my brain is going 19 to the dozen perhaps about something else and if i'm wanting to refocus back on that i have to get out and it's often i'm bouncing onto something else because there's just a knot that needs to be untangled and as andy says it's just having that space and the brain will often tick it through, at least in my case. By the time I've come back, I'm either ready or I know today is not today. It's going to have to be another day. Let's do something else. Yeah, yeah. well up on that one. I agree. Do you ever, do you ever dream about writing? Things yeah. come to you in dreams. I have, yeah. I've, um, I've taken quite a number of stories, especially short stories, from dreams. Or have been, you know, the, the nugget that's ignited them has been mm -hmm. a dream. Oh, I like uh, that. 
I've had yeah. other other dreams that I've been like while I'm dreaming them, thinking this is a fantastic story. <laughs> this this nar- narrative is brilliant. I've got to write all this down. And then you wake up and it's some you kind of come to yourself and you realise it was some nonsense about jumping in a litter bin or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in the dream, it seemed like um, amazing kind of um, creativity, and it was just actually. When, once it's hauled out into the light of day, it's a nonsense. But um, yeah, occasionally I have dreamt. Um, I, rem- I remember finishing a novel that I was reading, and then I dreamt that I r- wrote the next chapter, which was quite interesting. And I woke up thinking, "Oh, damn! So, <laughs> I'd better go do it then again." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but you know, it wasn't my book, so I couldn't. Um, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I misunderstood you. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, but I, you know, I figure if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm dreaming um, about writing that counts as billable hours. So, seems fair. <laughs> yeah. Completely. <laughs> um, back to Kilishandra. Uh, oh, no, it's Caravan. Read that wrong. Um, in plot, plot from the start, do plots survive characters? No, not at all. Um, the synopses that I tend to give my editor are off um, substantially different than the final book because things go off in different directions, characters change, different choices are made. Um, this, especially when I was writing the Akak Macak trilogy about a drunk, um, uplifted fighter pilot monkey. And I would have these scenes and plots plotted out and then realize that he would not stand for any of that nonsense and just cause mayhem. So I had to kind of readjust everything around his mayhem. So, um, yeah, it was, um, as I say, it, it's the writing and the, is the creative act for me in, in the doing rather than the plotting. So I like to, um, I like to just get the paint on the canvas rather than do a lot of prepar- preparatory drawing. Um, so, and I find out, you know, it's what, um, oh, who said, was it Michelangelo? I can't remember who said it, that, that the the sculpture exists within the stone. I just yeah, have to yeah. chip away everything that isn't the sculpture. That's Michelangelo. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's funny because I, I also am a teacher and I, like I've used that metaphor w- without ever realizing that I was, <laughs> I was plagiarizing Michelangelo. So I will, I will credit him next time. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Interesting. Um, it, another one from Kilishandra, which is sort of about daily routine. So when writing daily, do you set words per day, a set time, number of scenes? Do you, you know, set yourself interim goals that you can achieve and feel uplifted by? Um, if I get 500 good words, I'm quite happy. If I get 1,000 good words, I'm content. Um, I have had days where six to 8,000 words, but they are very far few and far between and i need a damn good rest afterwards Mm -hmm. um so yeah it's every single word is one step towards the end so you know if even if i get one sentence if it's a really good sentence then it's better than nothing so out of curiosity because we've had quite a lot of different writers with different approaches and a significant number of them do something I have never done and will continue never to do but I'm going to ask anyway and that's that they often allot a certain amount of time to writing and then allot a second amount of time to self-editing for the day and I have never and continue never to do that because I sort of self-edit as I go and I often ping back and go actually actually because of how I bounce about as I go or I just flow but I definitely don't do that. Do you have any sort of structure like that yourself? No, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, <laughs> I, What it comes down to is that I started writing as a hobby and as fun. Mm-hmm. And the minute it starts to feel like a job, it becomes mm-hmm. very difficult. So I have to keep the fun and I have to keep the spontaneity and I have to keep the, you know, I'm doing this because I'm enjoying it. And I'm so as if I start structuring it and, mm-hmm. and it, it starts to just become work and it, it's a weird psychological thing, but that's just the way it is. So I'd have to keep it spontaneous and fun and just, you know, I have to sit down and do it. Obviously. I mean, I, I couldn't, I, I've not just written 18 books just by sitting down and messing around. So I sit down and do it, but I have to sit down and do it as fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
I totally get that because quite a lot, perhaps directly addressing that, several of the authors we've had on are genre authors working on other people's IPs. Um, yeah. So because of that, they've actually got submission processes and editors who have far tighter control over the final work than might necessarily be the case of it just being their novel that they were presenting. So they've got to have a more structured, I suppose, format to do that. And yeah, a job. They're doing it as a job. Yeah. 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 I think this, this is why I've, I've struggled to write another IPs because it feels like, you know, work and I want to have yeah. fun. And I think the fun is what drives the drives my fiction is, is the fun of uh, writing it the fun of creating it and i think when that goes away it's very hard yeah yeah Diane, that makes sense Diane, to me. When I write a chapter i clean it up for obvious errors and then i print it when it's done then i gather up the whole printed manuscript at the end and go read through it for a full edit pass but that's all i do yeah same same mm. i i don't print because my eyesight's decided that it doesn't like print anymore <laughs> 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 screen <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sue, Sue Dian. I always, I never know how to pronounce this. Um, I look forward to reading Gareth, Gareth books, but there's also a little shout out for you, Andy Law. Um, oh no, sorry, that's not that. I, I'm enjoying learning from Andy's design and drawing of Caligan. Oh, for the maps. Mm, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. oh, thank you. a cartographer. No, nice. yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sue Dian. I hope I pronounced that right. Sometimes I pronounce it Sudayan and sometimes I do a weird like Su Suedian and I'm still not sure. So put in the chat how we're supposed to. Yeah, type, type yeah, it up phonetically for us. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for me. Or I'm don't and just leave her squirming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here's a good one. I'm very close to my heart because of the mm. musicality in our family. Um, Diane asks, what do, role does music play in your writing? Uh, it plays two roles, really. It's kind of a dual purpose. The first one is that I use it instead of cafe noise. Um, if I'm just, mm -hmm. if I need something to screen things out and keep me focused, so I use stuff um, that is quite quiet, um, but not too soporific. So like a uh, film soundtrack or yeah. uh, Tangerine Dream or Brian Eno or something. If it's too kind of ambient, I'll just... But... Um, <laughs> Just, just something to to keep that little distract, easily distractible part of my brain occupied. The other part is that I think there's a lot of music in the writing, that the rhythms and flow of the paragraphs and the sentences are something I'm keenly aware of how they sound. So that they, um, I like to write sentences that are easy to read, so they they sort of sweep you along. Mm -hmm. And there's no kind of jarring words or there's no jarring kind of. So from that point of view, yeah, there's very much there's a rhythm and flow. But also plotting wise, I think I usually have, uh, you know, several subplots on the go as well. And they kind of rise and fall along with the main plot so that they kind of contra sometimes contrast, sometimes complement. And that's kind of like a, a sort of... Um, you know, like in a, in a jazz band where you, you might have an alto sax and a trumpet sort of playing different phrases and in and weaving in and around each other. So, yeah, I mean, okay, three different ways then. Yeah, so, yeah, music music does. I mean, I'm not musical at all as a person. I can't read music. Um, I got thrown out of my school choir because I was making the entire back row go flat. Um <laughs> I've, I've never been able to play it. You know, I'm a total musical illiterate and I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. But, you know, but for some reason it comes out in the writing. So my, my mother says it's because my father was very Welsh and it's that Welsh kind of mm -hmm. rolling yeah. cadence. Yeah. Um, my, so funnily enough, one of the interns had a grade six theory exam today and we were doing our a bit of revision on the bus, yeah, our kids, our interns. Um, and she, and uh, we were talking about Baroque dances because she had to remember the forms, but I'm really interested. And in, I once wrote a, a book for the kids, it never went very much further, um, about a Clark, called the Clarsac. And, and I really played with the idea of taking the structure of, you know, a, a, some of the symphonies and the structure of a sonata, for example, and, and, and playing that through the book. So I, I'm quite keen to go back and explore that because there's lots of mu music is like beautiful maths. When you actually get down to it, it's all maths, but it's beautiful maths. And I'm really fascinated to go back and explore that a bit more. And maybe the interns will because they're at the start of their careers rather than me. 
in the middle. I, I'm incredibly bad at maths as well. I, I never, <laughs> <laughs> I, I never managed to learn my times tables or anything. It's just you know, that's probably why I'm no good at music. It's just, just um, out of curiosity, just to wheedle down a little bit on that one. Do you find that if the music has got lyrics, that it impossibly in interferes with what you're doing or do you like having a, the occasional low-key amount of lyrics in there does that help to inspire do you have a no. particular position i find lyrics either distract or worm their way into the you know so i'll be writing i realize i've just written a paragraph about a character called bar 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah but i'm i'm exactly the same with with one notable exception and this is like it's going to be like the most, I guess, insulting compliment I could ever give a band. But I don't know if you remember the late '90s band Semisonic, who had that song "Closing yeah. Time." That was pretty fair. Their their album "Feeling Strangely Fine" is I find it like sonic wallpaper. Um, I can have that playing in the background, and I don't hear the lyrics. It just it might as well not have any lyrics yeah. in it. That's how bland and inoffensive it is. Yeah. So it, it's brought me great zen and focus when writing, but that's probably not what they were going for. I suppose. That, that said, I can listen to opera if it's in Italian. Because because no, then, uh, mm, then mm, the, mm. the voice is just another instrument. So. Yeah, I'd actually yeah. considered that. Yeah, because quite do. quite a lot of the film soundtracks have got like choral elements they as do. well, um, like June and and um, Lord yeah. of the Rings and stuff. So yeah, yeah. whenever uh, I listen to Lord of the Rings, I always I always get thrown out when the the sort of the, the Annie Lennox song comes on with actual words, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> where yeah. did that come from? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, uh, it's the same with the Dracula soundtrack at the end when the Annie Lennox yeah. one comes on with the words. Annie Lennox, the bane of writers. <laughs> She's got form. <laughs> <laughs> because that Dracula soundtrack has got an amazing atmosphere yeah. and then, then no. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah, if you wanted to write something it's a beautiful song, tense and... But it, it really like brings you out of it. Yeah. So Sue Edgin says, um, there's some of Stephen Donaldson's writing that reminds me of different musical forms, in particular, a dialogue between four characters, each with a very distinct voice. Hmm. Right. Let I'm, us, sure, I'm so sure just... Donaldson explicitly brings music and lyrics into some of his stuff, doesn't he? I think. I can't recall. I haven't read any Stephen Donaldson for years. In, I read the... them... Back the, in my twenties, I think the the, fam the famous one that his name has just left my brain. What Thomas Covenant? Yes, I'm sure in yeah. Thomas Covenant, the, the, the lyrics from from his life in this world are kind of feature in it. Yeah, somehow. very possible. Yeah. Jen says yes yeah. in yeah. the chat. But <laughs> to just on that of character <laughs> voice, and let's move on to this one from Kilishandra. So, how best to handle character introductions? Different for protagonists, antagonists, others. Different in every book. How how do you? Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, um, years ago, I saw something about the making of Star Wars where, you know, the, the Darth Vader just kind of first scene comes through the door in the rebel ship and goes, you know, where's the plans? And apparently everyone was going to George, you know, that's your bad guy and that's how you're going to introduce him just straight out the gate. I mean, surely there should be a build up and a, but George is just like, no, it's just going to have him bang straight in the middle so you know there are i don't think there's an ideal way to handle a character introduction i mean every character is different every story is different um i think if you want your character to be the antagonist and to be really bad um and really scary sometimes it helps not to see them but just hear about them for a while mm -hmm. um so so that you know when you actually come face to face with them or when your protagonist comes face to face with them they've heard a lot of bad stuff and they're already kind of on edge and scary um but mm, i don't know i don't think there's an ideal way to do it you could also do that where they just appear out of nowhere and you know like the predator and kill everyone <laughs> so it's um, <laughs> yeah it's yeah yeah, I guess it depends on the character and what you want to do with the character as well. And, yeah. and, and, and on the type of story, I think. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, in The Godfather, like, famously, like, obviously, you see, like, you have the actual scene with Marlon Brown at the start, but the, the wedding scene, like, you don't see Michael Corleone for ages. But what you have is almost a montage of people going, Where's Michael? Is Michael here yet? Has anybody seen Michael? Is Michael arrived? And it's like, again, it's establishing the importance of that character so that when he does arrive in his army uniform looking like the hero, you're like, Ah, this is the protagonist of the movie. He has arrived. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I in Game of Thrones when they introduce um Jamie and Cersei's dad, what's his name? Tywin. Um, and he's like Tywin getting that Lannister. ear. Yeah, Tywin Lannister. I thought that was a really interesting way to introduce him because it's not the kind of activity you would associate with a nobleman. And and there's something innately threatening and terrifying. Brutal. About, yeah. Brutal about that. And precise though as well. And pre yeah. but precise, yeah, I really loved that. I it caught our eye at the time. Um, just a, a different it didn't meet my expectations of how I would be introduced to him and as a result I was like that was just spot on yeah out of curiosity where do you think your position lies and how much should or shouldn't be described about the characters and how much you should leave to the reader's imagination is there particular parts that you like to focus in on that you're interested in or do you t prefer a sketchier outline to allow the character to breathe through the imagination I try to focus on just like a handful of telling details mm -hmm. um so i you know none of my characters look in a mirror uh, you know do that classic kind of self description um so i like to i like to have just the same as i when i'm describing scenes or, or or whatever just a few little details that suggest the rest so you know i'll say someone has a, a mustache that lies like sweat on his upper lip and that gives you a kind of idea of Ooh. like <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> slimy. <laughs> yeah, or, or I'll say a waitress has dried egg, painted nails, and dried egg on her sleeve, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just to, you know, it, and um, I, I might, okay, you know, I very rarely mention hair color or eye color or any of that. I'm not one of these people that does like a, a Dungeons and Dragons character sheet for each character in the book before I start, which. You know, that caused me problems with, uh, with the editor of the macaque books because the monkey's got an eye patch. was like, Gareth, can you please make up your mind which sodding eye the eye patch is on? <laughs> 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 yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's... Uh, I just like to... I, I like to describe enough and to have the character come through from the way they speak and the dialogue as much as, like, physically. You know, I'll, I'll give a sketch roughly, you know, their middle-aged they got long hair wearing a big coat or something like that but enough to to picture them without pinning them like a butterfly onto the page mm. and that that might be one of the reasons i, I like the embers of war series particularly because i i have we talked about the stream before i have a fantasia so i don't have much of a visual imagination so too much character description is just wasted on me so that extra information that's not not doing anything whereas voice i find really important so yeah mm. Yeah, and just a follow up on that. Martine asked, "How much time and detail do you think it's worth spending on a character you intend to kill?" It it depends how significant their death is to the story. Yeah, yeah. if it's very significant, a lot of time. Um, good example is um, the movie Aliens, where we spend it's, it's over an hour before they actually meet an alien, but that entire hour we're getting to know the Marines. And the ones that will die in the first like attack, we don't really get to know too well. But the rest of them, so um, so by the by the time um, Vasquez and Spunkmeyer, who are, I think the last two to go, then we're really kind of like mm -hmm. gutted by it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it depends. You know, if they're henchmen maybe not a great deal of time but if they're people that really matter to the um to the protagonist then yeah probably put in a lot get the i mean if you can get the audience really gutted that a character is dead you've done your job so yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's it if, if you don't know the characters the death has very little stakes beyond the mechanical plot stakes right and if, if you why want should that, i care I think, yeah. yeah yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> poor yeah, so, Ned. Yeah, poor <laughs> Ned. <laughs> it's the inevitable. We all, we always think of that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I thought Alien's character development was excellent, and Diane said uh, the scene on the dropship is masterful. You get the gist of everyone on the team instantly. Yeah, yeah James Cameron knows how to do his job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you and can that, tell yeah. like that that scene's been like. I wouldn't say ripped off, but like referenced or homaged so many times, obviously very notably in Starship Troopers, but you know, it, it's such an iconic scene that is it lives in everyone's brain now. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's the same in the um uh saving private Ryan on the, the landing craft. Mm. 
and, and also <laughs> I, on, that I can't remember what it was called. I don't, so for us, it's um, Edge of Tomorrow, Live, Die, Repeat, where he's oh, yeah. in that dropship over and over again. And every yeah. time, different people are dying when he comes out of the dropship in different ways. That's a very underrated movie, I think. Yeah, I agree oh, completely. I love it. Love it. Yeah, love yeah, it. yeah. Good film. Excellent. Yeah. Um, <sighs> So, and Marty, then, on a related point to killing characters, how do you avoid fridging characters, your antagonists kill, that are close to the primary, primary protagonists? Um, I don't know. I mean, you can choose the characters you're going to kill and don't, you know, I think the fridging is the, is the, um, is kind of like, killing a female character to give a male character plot motivation. motivation and it's incredibly lazy way of doing it and it's it's you know not good or that you know or if you you fridge the um uh characters of color or or if you fridge um you know fridge the gays or the gay whatever. characters yeah as is yeah. often the case yeah, I mean, even even Star Trek Discovery did that, but they yeah. you know, brought them back by mushroom magic. But, um, <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I think, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, choose wisely which characters you kill off and why. If you're just killing characters to give your antagonist um, plot motivation, revenge is an in incredibly overused and tired motivation. I think you can probably do it a lot easier a lot easier a lot a lot better than that yeah yeah i suppose why is the big one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and ensuring you have very clean defined reasons and if you don't yeah yeah yeah, yeah. or if, <laughs> if it's just to show your antagonist is a bad guy a bad guy mm. then you know um but mm. also then you know you you've would have had to have made the reader care about those characters and then just kill them off for no reason would, would kind of risk your reader's trust, I think. Yeah. So I, I would like to add this, this question, and the, um, my fellow screenies will will confirm that this is not just being asked because Diane is in the chat. It was <laughs> planned in advance. So I want to give a little <laughs> shout out to Diane and her anthology of short stories, um, poems. It, the, the Shadow Galaxy, not just Shadow Galaxy, The Shadow Galaxy, which I read um, after we had Diane on the stream. It wasn't a few weeks ago. Everyone will tell you that I always say a few weeks ago. It could be anything from a month to 15 years when I say a few weeks ago. Um, I think it was like a month ago. I attest this as truth. truth yeah. <laughs> um, and we talked a lot about the influence of place on her writing, but I then went and read um, The Shadow Galaxy and it spoke to me unexpectedly. I mean, I expected it to be good, but it spoke to me so deeply on a level I didn't expect because the way Diane writes women and women's experience is really rare especially uh, as a as a parent there was just something about it that i came i read it in the bath because i do most of my reading in the bath and i came out and i filled the bath up a few times which is also what i do much to the irritation of other people who want to use that bathroom and and i came out and i was like andy i just wish i could write this but for for my life and where i come from because it's so it is honestly so good I was just floored by it and it really inspired me to go away and think about how I could do that myself, which I think is a mark of actually an amazing writer. So I was honestly blown away by it. So go and buy it and read it. It is brilliant. But Place, we talked a lot about Place on the stream, Gareth, and I wondered whether you had any ties to location and whether that resonates with you and if, if there's a location that influences your work. Uh, yeah, I will just say that, you know, uh, reiterate with the Shadow Galaxy, I think it's amazing. Um, people may think I'm biased because obviously <laughs> Diane is my wife, but I, I, I think she really tapped into some kind of archetypal storytelling voice that like a fairy tale almost, but in a, there's some way of telling the way she tells her stories really taps in and feels as old as the kind of mountains yes. that she's describing and so on. So I think um, you know, I recommend everybody go out and buy that book immediately. Buy two <laughs> copies. And 
um but with i mean ties to location i mean obviously i'm i'm uh british so i have that um and I, i've traveled in europe and it's only in the last couple of years i've been um to the states so i guess i have a kind of more um i come from the more british tradition of science fiction so i come from um Arthur C. Clarke, J.G. Ballard, M. John Harrison, yeah, yeah. you know, rather than from, um, sorry, oh, mine's gone completely blank here. Um, but, you, you know, rather than from the, the sort of Zap Powell, let's go, ah, universe. A bit more, um, less pulp. Yeah. So um, I, I come less, less from, yeah, less from that. So slightly more kind of new wave and psychological rather than the cyberpunk and the, you know, gotcha. although I mean, obviously, I, I, I read American sci fi growing up and obviously exposed to a lot of it in the movies. Um, but I think I, I come from a slightly more British tradition. So, my I think I, I once described it to somebody in, after evening in a pub. So, let me out as American science fiction of the sort of last half of the 20th century was more the fiction of a rising empire, whereas British science fiction uh, is a fiction of a collapsed yeah, empire. Yeah, yeah. So in, in European and British science fiction, we're walking around in the ruins, we're walking around on bones. Mm -hmm. You know, anywhere in Europe, you dig a hole, you'll probably dig up, you know, there was probably a battle there at some point over the last few hundred thousand years. Whereas America is much more, it was a new country, a new frontier, and it's a slightly different way of looking at things. And I think that's why a lot of my science fiction, there are ancient alien ruins there. Are, because, you know, the British um, culture is basically built out of the bits and pieces the Romans left behind. Yeah. And, and so I think my science fiction tends to reflect that rather than the brave new world of going out and conquering and discovery. So it's a small thing and, and it's obviously massive generalization there but yeah but, but yeah i think it's well, a good generalization though that speaks yeah. to me yeah. it's really interesting yeah sue edgen had had a point in in the chat um a question which actually follows on quite well from this so i've gone back to it thanks for reposting it so i think that one came from jay diane dotson first actually Oh, did I it? Okay. Did. Yeah, Question: I think. How to how do you approach big concept ideas in your science fiction? Are you into jargon or another method? No, no. I uh, jargon drives me up the wall. So, <laughs> what I, I try and make my stories as accessible as possible, but without. I will mention scientific concepts, but I will try and hint how they work, or or you know, mm -hmm. so on. Um. I assume a certain amount of knowledge. Um, so I'm not reinventing the wheel the whole time, but I'm not one of these, you know, I don't just cram scientific words and, and uh, concepts into the book. I, I try and write for people who maybe aren't totally well-versed in that kind of thing, but I like to think maybe, I mean, as a kid, it was reading science fiction that taught me a lot of what I know about science. Mm -hmm. So I would like to think that maybe I, I do that a little bit, but I've had a lot of people say they picked up like Embers of War, for instance, and I don't usually read science fiction, but I really enjoyed this because yeah. I've tried to uh, um, not make it sound super sciencey, but just concentrate on the characters. Um, the example I give is that if I was writing in the modern day, and I wrote about a character going and getting in his car to drive to Sainsbury's. I wouldn't have four pages about the workings of the internal combustion engine and the, history, yeah. the OPEC oil crisis. <laughs> I, so when the, <laughs> when the characters get in their spaceship, they get in their spaceship and they fly away. And I, yeah. That one's really set me off. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so perfect. Much about yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty much my childhood yeah. written written before me. I, my my parents were deep, deep science fiction and fantasy fans, and I had libraries when I was a child, and I read everything. 
um, from pretty much 19, well, whenever, right through to when I was born. And it was all there for me to pick and choose from. And there is a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember recommending once, um, I think it was Hyperion, um, Dan Simmons Hyperion to someone. Yeah. And they literally couldn't read it. They got but they got stuck in a couple mm -hmm. words at the beginning. And it was such a shame because the book was, it would have spoken to them. They'd have really enjoyed it. But it was exactly that issue. They went, oh, no, no, I'm lost. Toss. Um, yeah. And that was a failure. Do you oh, do you yeah. consider yourself a genre writer? I mean, I find like I grew up reading science fiction and fantasy because that's what my dad got out of the library, and I just like picked them up and became hooked on that. And I never really considered that anything other than reading books. So, as a writer, do you just I I, I would just consider people as writers or not writers. So, do you feel the same? Yeah, is genre a tool or a constraint? How do you? The feel question's about already there. Yeah. Um, I consider myself a short story writer. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. I consider myself a science fiction writer mm -hmm. who dabbles in a bit of horror here and there, and a bit of yeah. you know what, what what else I want. But primarily, you know, nearly all my books have got spaceships on the front. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, um, I find you know, people use the term mm -hmm. spec fiction, speculative fiction, but I found outside of writers and publishing. A lot of readers haven't got a clue what that means. They think you're just, yeah. you know, people think you're just writing it on spec. Um, so, um, so I don't use that. And so I think science fiction is whether or not the term even means anything anymore. Um, you know, people argue like is Star Wars science fiction. They, it doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a story with a spaceship in it, and. Um, if you like stories of spaceships in it, you're going to enjoy it. So it's more like a, a, a marketing tool, or but more than that, it's a tool for finding stuff you like. So if I want that kind of book, I know where to look because it's a science fiction book. Um, I, I thoroughly read outside my, my genre all the time. I encourage everybody to read outside their chosen genres all the time. But for me... Um, it's just a way I can describe easily what I do. So, um, yeah, and it, it it's a set of tools, and it's a, a you know a big toy box with science fiction written on it that I can dive into and pull stuff out of. So, um, yeah, sci-fi till I die. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about so short versus long fiction. What benefit might novelists have by writing short fiction? And there's a little follow up to that, which we will um, we need to put links in. I think we already have, but you have a short story collection just announced, and it's intriguing oh, yeah. to see how that differs. So let's go back to that short versus long fiction. Um, sometimes writing short fiction between novels is like having a sorbet between courses to cleanse the palate and to to work stuff out. Um, short stories are also, um, as I mentioned earlier, I started off writing short stories and they are a very good way to experiment with styles, with ideas, um, and a very good way to, you know, work through all your influences. You start off writing like the two or three writers you really read the most and enjoy the most, and then you gradually discover your own voice. And it's a lot quicker to do that in 5,000 word short stories than to do it in a series of like. 10 unpublished novels so um I, I find and also you can try out ideas in short stories that maybe you might want to go and write a novel about later because um you can just do it quickly and you know a couple of days work rather than you know a year's work to find out it doesn't work so it's uh, they're a good test bed um and they're fun for dipping in and out of as a reader um, so it's fun to dip in and out of as a writer as well. If I wanted to try a completely different style, I think I would probably try and do a short story first mm. uh, in that style just to see how comfortable I was with it. Um, and they're a good way of getting noticed as well. If you're pub being published in the genre magazines, as I said, then they're a good way of kind of building up to, so that, you know, like a character introduction, when you finally present your novel manuscript, the editor's like, oh, I have heard of this person. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. And Andy, Andy Leask, I think you have a question and a, and a prop to go along with it. If you want to... I did, yeah, I do have a prop. Ooh. 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 Um, yeah, so one of the things I think is really interesting about the Continuance series is that it's a duology, although I did notice your website says for now, um, so maybe there'll be more. But 
the, the fact that there's two books, but they're not sequential, so you don't need to read them in a particular order. You can read them in any order. And I just, I thought that's interesting because it's not often that you get, particularly in, in sci-fi, but really it, it, anywhere that you get series that aren't ongoing, one leads to the next to the next. I just wonder, I suppose, like, why did you do that? And what were the, the challenges, the benefits of that? I did it after a conversation with my editor at Titan Books. Um, and it's very much the kind of thing they want to see more of at the moment because they find with series of trilogies that um, by the time it gets to the third book, they find it very hard to interest reviewers in reviewing. Um, and there's always a slight sales tail, tail off um, across the course of a trilogy. And when you're trying to kind of launch the second book of a trilogy, a lot of people are like, ah, I'll wait for the, I'll wait, wait for the whole thing. Yeah. 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 Whereas if you're writing standalone books, then each one can be kind of like, here's a brand new book. Come on, you can pick it up and buy it now. Um, but it has, but setting it in the same universe as other books gives the kind of um, the comfort of a series, but with the the, with the freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the term they used? Onboarding. Nice. <laughs> so you can yeah. on, onboard readers at any point. Yeah. But they feel, you know, they feel they're reading a, a series. So um, I think Stark Holborn is doing the same thing. She's also published by Titan Books. She's got her novels, um, Ted Lowe and Hell's Eight, are set um, against the same background but are standalones. Um, and Descendant Machine and Stars and Bones are they're set in the same <laughs> universe. But... So what I did, I went away and I came up with a universe that I felt I could tell lots of different stories in. Mm -hmm. um, so Stars and Bones is much more as horror-tinged. It's much more sort of John Carpenter's The Thing meets Battlestar Galactica, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Descendant Machine, which is set 50 years later, is much more of your sort of core science fiction. There's this big mysterious alien machine and we had to find out how it works. Um, you know, it's like the like the um, the briefcase in the movie Ronan, if anyone's seen that, mm. where they're, they're all these different parties chasing around trying to get this briefcase, but you never find out what's in the briefcase until till right at the end. So it's like a big Schrodinger's cat kind of um, <laughs> situation. So it's it's yeah, so it's it's much more big dumb object or rather than horror. So if I find another story I, that fits that background, I could I can come back to that at a later date yeah. um and i suppose you don't have the pressure to continue playing in that particular universe that you would if it was a series like you know i think we're all aware of like for instance like patrick rothfuss and like the, the third of that trilogy that's you know been a decade now that, and i i don't envy him the pressure he must be feeling also the fans are like where is it where's the net you know we need this story finished and it, it takes that pressure away from everybody so yeah. Well, I'd, I'd just come off the back of writing two trilogies back to back. Mm. So mm. having this idea of setting them. And the example um, Kath my editor used was Ian Banks's Culture series, where it's a, it's a definite series, but yeah. you can just read it in any order, really. Um, so, and that really appealed to me because that's one of my kind of touchstones yeah. of the genre. So, um yeah, so, I mean, people ask, will there be more books in that series? And the answer is yes, if I think of a story that, that fits yeah. that universe, then, then definitely. We, there's one question here, but, um, Diane, I'm afraid we're not going to have time to answer it because we've just all practically reached our allotted hour, but we'll pop it up just so people know that Future's Edge um, was just announced and um, she wanted you to talk about inventing a whole new universe. So maybe we will be able to get you back on a stream in future. Um, maybe even with Diane, that would be lovely. We've never done that. Oh, well, that would be a lovely stream, wouldn't it? Um, nice, yeah. Talk about, about oh, that'd be great. Universes. Um, but it, 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 you, you may say no. This has been the worst experience of a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, I'm, I'm... I, wish, I wish I had been watching the introduction to Eurovision. That is what you may say to me. Um, <laughs> we've had. It's been brilliant to talk to you, Gareth. Um, I hope you enjoyed that as much as yeah. we did, and I can see the viewers did. Some people saying that they're going to go back and watch it slowly and take notes um, because you've dropped quite a few gems in there. So, yeah, thank you so much for coming on the stream. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pretty blast. Yeah. Good fun. 
absolutely brilliant then so um we will be back again next week we will share with you in the week who that's going to be um but until then um thank you so much to gareth thanks to the andes as always um thank you to our patrons without whom we couldn't do this and thank you to our wonderful discord community and patrons for um, getting involved in the questions and of course thanks to you the live viewers and anyone watching afterwards on youtube hi um, thanks to g diane dotson brilliant comments and uh please do like subscribe share do all of those things that we always ask you to do and until the next time all that remains for me to say is goodbye bye about writing and caw -caw, caw -caw. see you soon <laughs> <laughs>